I'm Gary Giddens. I'm the executive director of the Leon Levy Center, and we're delighted to have you here for our fifth annual conference. Uh, we were founded in 2007 with a generous grant from the Leon Levy Foundation, and I uh, always want to thank Shelby White, the administrator of the foundation, for her generous support. She couldn't be here, but the indispensable Judith Dobrinsky is here uh, from the Leon Levy Center, and we thank her. I want to thank President Kelly, who could not be here, and Provost Chase Robinson, who will be here a little later, uh, for the incredible support that they've given us uh, at the Graduate Center. And uh, I especially want to thank all the participants who are going to uh, be on the stage. It's really an astonishing lineup, and we're very proud to have them. One of the traditions of this uh, event is to introduce you to the fellows. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, we have a fellowship program that we're very proud of, where we give grants to four uh, emerging biographers and uh, two dissertation students. And they come to New York and they have offices upstairs and they work, and uh, before long they produce biographies and we feel uh, there's nothing like when a new book comes in, you feel that the, the organization is somewhat responsible. So I want to introduce you. I don't know if they're all here, but um, I'm going to ask you to stand up as I, as I mention your names and hold your applause. Susan Bernofsky is writing a biography of Robert Valser. Langdon Hammer is writing a biography of James Merrill. Siobhan Roberts is writing a biography of the mathematician John Horton Conway. Damien Searles is writing a biography of Herman Rorschach. And our dissertation students are Peter Christian Agner, who's writing Daniel Patrick Moynihan and the Reconstruction of Liberalism, and Lauren Kaplan, Crossing the Atlantic Italians in Argentina. Please. I also, I'm not sure if she's here, but I want to acknowledge and thank my predecessor, Nancy Milford, one of the originators of, of, this, um, of this center, and David Nassau, who is here, and we really probably wouldn't exist without them. In fact, I'm certain of it. Each spring, the conference explores different avenues of biography. What is a biography? What purpose does it serve? How do we go about pursuing the art and the craft? One could hardly ask for a more inspiriting answer than that given by Catherine Drinker Bowen when explaining why she wrote her famous 1944 biography of Oliver Wendell Holmes' Yankee from Olympus. I'm just going to read this few sentences. The more I learned about Oliver Wendell Holmes, the more insupportable it became to think of him as dead, cold, and motionless beneath the stone at Arlington. I found myself possessed by a witch's frenzy to ungrave this man, stand him upright, see him walk, jump, dance, tell jokes, make love, display his vanity or his courage as the case might be. National encomium, the laying on of laurels, had only buried him deeper. The difficulty was to uncover material that gave proof of life. Not noble public posture, but characteristic brief turns of phrase, small oddities and manners that belong to Holmes and to Holmes alone. She makes it sound so easy. Today's conference explores the perhaps ironic but indisputable fact that so many of the very greatest biographies ever written uh, are about not politicians and the military leaders that Plutarch wrote about when he originated the form, but about writers. And indeed, some of the most celebrated biographies of all time are about other biographers. And with that, I'm going to introduce, I'm only going to introduce the moderators today, and they will introduce the panelists. And our moderator for the first program, first panel, is our own deputy director. Oh, I, I failed to identify this, the small uh, group that we are at the Leon Levy Center, and I especially want to acknowledge Michael Gately, who, without whom he runs the organization. He's our events programmer. Michael, please stand up. There he is. He got all these flags and the incredible flowers, and um, if you ever contact us or make uh, 
uh, an uh, arrangement to be here at any of our events, all of which are free, you probably speak to Michael. Our deputy director is the distinguished biographer John Madison, whom I'm going to introduce now. He's a distinguished professor of English at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, who worked as a litigator before turning to literature. He has a history degree from Princeton, a law degree from Harvard, and a PhD in English from Columbia, where he wrote his dissertation. He is currently teaching a seminar on biography as genre at the Graduate Center, a history of biography as a literary form since 1791. His first biography, Eden's Outcast, the story of Louisa May Alcott and her father, won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for biography, and his most recent biography, The Lives of Margaret Fuller, which is in paperback as of, I think, this week and is for sale outside, published by Norton, now in paperback, won the 2012 Ansberber Sperber Prize as the year's outstanding biography of a journalist or other figure in media. He will also be here, make a note in your calendars on April 16th to interview John Bryant on uh, bi biography and Herman Melville. So please welcome John Madison. Gary, thank you so much. And uh, my thanks to all of you for, uh, for being in attendance uh, here today. Um, Gary deserves a few words as well. Uh, the, the director of our center, um, a, a man who has made the Leanne Levy Center more active, more relevant than it ever has been before, um, a, a man whom I consider to be an ideal ambassador not only for the humanities, but for humanity in general. I admire your scholarship very much, but not quite so much as I prize and praise your kindness. Um, for the benefits that you confer upon our fellows, for our splendid public programs, and for so very much more, you may be deeply, deeply proud. So, thank you. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson, that greatest of transcendental sages, posited that there is no final limit to our knowledge. He wrote in his essay, Circles, quote, every ultimate fact is only the first of a new series. Every general law is only a particular fact of some more general law presently to disclose itself. There is no outside, no enclosing wall, no circumference to us. The man finishes his story, how good, how final, how it puts a new face on all things. He fills the sky. Lo, on the other hand, on the other side, rises also a man and draws a circle around the circle. We had just pronounced the outline of the sphere. For this panel on writing the American Renaissance, we are privileged today to have with us three extraordinary scholars who have made careers drawing circles, or should I say running rings, around what we previously thought and knew about American culture in the decades before the Civil War, and uh, whom it's my pleasure to introduce to you today. Henry David Thoreau wrote in Walden, quote, we are made to exaggerate the importance of what work we do, unquote true enough for most of us, but nonetheless, exaggeration is all but impossible when one discusses the contributions of our first guest, uh, Jeffrey Kramer, to our understanding of Thoreau. The curator of collections at the Thoreau Institute at Walden Woods, he is the editor of the award-winning Walden, a fully annotated edition, as well as the Maine Woods, a fully annotated edition, and I to myself, an annotated selection from the journal of Henry David Thoreau. His current project is Solid Seasons, a biography of the friendship of Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. Welcome, Jeffrey. When one reads a book on a subject which oneself has also recently um, addressed, two emotions tend to emerge in jarring alteration, alternation, rather. The fact that every new, uh, sorry, every fact in the new work is either known to you, and this is an occasion for boredom, or the fact is something you did not know, in which case the regnant emotion is mounting terror. It is thus perhaps the highest compliment that I can pay our second guest, Megan Marshall, uh, that I have at times found her recently published book, an extraordinary study, Margaret Fuller, A New American Life, as more personally horrifying than a Stephen King novel. 
Ms. Marshall is an assistant professor at Emerson College. Her previous contribution to the literature on the American Renaissance, The Peabody Sisters, Three Women Who Ignited American Romanticism, was awarded the Francis Parkman Prize, the Mark Linton History Prize, and the Massachusetts Book Award. The Peabody Sisters was also a named finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Biography. Professor Marshall has graciously joined us today uh, on the day after a reading in Concord, Massachusetts, and three days before an appearance at the uh, Boston Athenaeum. We acknowledge both her generosity and her stamina. Uh, I would also like to mention that there are copies of uh, the recently released uh, Margaret Fuller, A New Romantic Life, available in the lobby. Um, finally, um, David S. Reynolds is a man truly for all seasons a distinguished professor of English here at the CUNY Graduate Center, and a man whose work has truly helped to revolutionize our understanding of the pre-Civil War era. The recipient of accolades too many to mention, he has, among other things, received the Christian Gauss Award for his book, Beneath the American Renaissance, The Subversive Imagination in the Age of Emerson and Melville, also uh, available um, in, in the lobby, uh, and the Bancroft Prize for Whitman's America, a cultural biography. He has reaped more recent renown for his works Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Battle for America, and John Brown, Abolitionist, the man who killed slavery, sparked the Civil War, and ceded civil rights. My sincerest thanks to all of you for joining us here today. I'd, um, I'd like to begin with a general observation, uh, which is that each of us uh, here on the stage has devoted quite a bit of time and effort to the proposition that some people take to be controversial, namely that external circumstances and the social and political world that surround an author um, um, have significant bearing on the art that the author produces. For decades now, textual critics have argued that works of literature are autonomous, and that the life of the author is not an apt or important subject for critical study. Now, it's pretty clear to me, me that all of us disagree, uh, so let me pose the question to everyone. What do we have to gain as students of literature by restoring historical context and telling the story of authors? And any of you are free to respond first. Well, I have been thinking coming here how um, Margaret Fuller is perhaps the least known of some of the subjects that we have to discuss, um, and she herself wrote an interesting observation of Mary Wollstonecraft. She said that she was a woman whose existence better proved the need of some new interpretation of women's rights than anything she wrote. I think, you know, why are we interested in the lives of these people as much as the writings? And I think in the case of the transcendentalists anyway, maybe all these writers of the American Renaissance, their, their lives and their works, their writings are so well matched that you can't help but want to explore the life of the person who wrote these words that are telling us how to live our lives. Yeah. Certainly, for, for somebody like Thoreau, who's, who's tied so closely to the things going on in his time politically, the thing that makes him so interesting to people today still is that he went beyond his time. So though something like civil disobedience comes from his night in jail protesting slavery, mm -hmm. um, what we get out of it is something greater than that and something more universal. Yeah. David? Yeah, uh, Emerson wrote that the ideas of the time are in the air and in fact all who breathe that we learn of our co contemporaries what they know through, uh, without effort, effort almost through the pores of our skin. And it seems to me one of the tasks of the biographer then is to, to explore those signifiers and uh, images and themes and ideas that are current in the culture and that become absorbed. For example, in someone like Walt Whitman who uh, said, I'm absorbing all of America. I'm a surrounded, surrounded by America as with vast oceanic tides that flow into me. So it seems to me that part of my role as a Whitman biographer is to see what those tides are, those currents flowing into him. Yeah, I, I don't have the, the quotation in front of me, but I do recall that Emerson had something to say about the fact that uh, young men in libraries study Cicero and, and, and Bacon and want to imitate them without realizing that Cicero and Bacon were once young people in libraries writing those right. books themselves. Yeah. And I, I think it's very true of all of the, the figures we've, we've just mentioned, Thoreau, Fuller, and Whitman, that life mattered to them. It wasn't just what they were writing, but uh, for Margaret Fuller, one of her greatest projects was, was her own self-culture, to become the most perfect person she could be. Thoreau wanted to live in a way such that, on deathbed, he would feel that he had lived. 
And Whitman, of course, is an avatar of, of, of life, not only of the person, but, but of, uh, of an entire nation. Um, I have another question, which is, um, to what extent, uh, if at all, uh, have, have all of you found writing the American Renaissance as a means toward introspection? Uh, I'm, I'm curious about the ways in which your self-knowledge uh, may have benefited from your writing about, about these other people. Well, for me, um, the amount of time I spent with Thoreau um, certainly has increased my self-awareness. One of the things that I find most fascinating about Thoreau is how much he questions those concepts that we think of as Thoreauvian, and he's constantly mm -hmm. revising his own life through them. Um, and so the questions that he is asking himself are questions that I feel as a, as a human being I need to ask myself, and therefore it ca creates a lot of introspection. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, uh, maybe some of you know that I spent 20 years working on my Peabody Sisters book, and it, it was a process I felt, you know, in a way I was growing up along with them, and uh, I learned some, I, I remember certain moments where things in their lives really spoke to me. I think in those 20 years, most of the time I thought maybe I'll never finish this book. And if I never do, what, what is the value of my life? And this is the kind of question I think the transcendentalists were asking, and in particular Sophia Peabody, who was a painter, a talented painter, and, but she was given to illness, and she was c conflicted about actually pursuing a, a profession as a painter. And, and this was, I think she ultimately decided, yes, her, her life was of value, even if she didn't produce these great works of art that people expected of her. So, um, I came to that conclusion about myself. I'll just keep doing it. I'll keep doing it even if I don't finish. But another very meaningful moment was uh, coming across a, a, a time when Elizabeth Peabody was running conversations in a way for women. She didn't call them that, but classes like the ones that Fuller later began. And um, she said, we, you know, we began to think, well, what, what is woman's character? And um, women should be contemplative, she said, but we also must act. And in her letter, she says, I must be myself and act. And I thought, you know, I'll finish this book. <laughs> yeah, the way uh, the American Renaissance figures inspire me is that uh, the importance of self-education uh, um, and autodidacticism. Walt Whitman didn't go beyond the age of 11 in school. Of course, Lincoln only had about one year of school, too. And yet Lincoln could recite uh, Shakespeare uh, at length, and Walt Whitman uh, used, was second only to, sh to, to Shakespeare in the amount of different words, vocabulary words he uses in his poetry. And yet he barely went to school, and it shows you the importance of, of education, but also inspiring your students to educate themselves over time, and not just to be satisfied with what they learn in classes. That's part of it. But then that has to be a springboard. And to me, all these Ameri uh, Melville said, uh, uh, a whaling ship was my Yale and my Harvard. Uh, Emily Dickinson went to one year at Mount Holyoke, but then she became the greatest female poet. So it seems to me that this is really, really, really important to inspire in our students. Self-education, learning, curiosity, curiosity. Um, and, and David, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you've actually focused your comments so far on, on Whitman, because your book on Whitman is one of, the, 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 one of your many great works, but it, it's the one that most interest, interests me at the moment. Uh, because it's a book in which you consciously blur the distinctions that we presume to exist among biography, history, and cultural criticism. Can you explain to me some of your, your, your theory, some of your thought behind synthesizing these scholarly genres in Whitman and cultural biography? Well, Walt Whitman was influenced by orators, by preachers, by scientists. His curiosity was so omnivorous, it was incredible. So it was my task as a biographer to go out and actually read the sermons and read the science works and read the, uh, uh, you know, all the elements and study the city life and all these things that he acknowledged were very, very direct and powerful influences on him and that le left their uh, deep imprint on his poetry, on his great, great poetry, which is really all absorptive. So uh, my task was then to go out and, and, and read and learn about all those contexts that directly stream into him. Yeah, it seems to be a particularly apt way of approaching Whitman, uh, whose, whose self is so um, polymorphous and at the same time so enigmatic. It's like on, on the one hand, um, his great poem, Song of Myself, purports to tell us who he is, but then when we read the poem, we don't really find a single comprehensible individual. We find instead the cosmos, right? the, the, the character who can, contains multitudes. 
Um, and so you sometimes you come away asking, well, will the real Walt Whitman stand up? Um, who is your Walt Whitman? Who, who, who is this guy behind well, all of these masks? he says turbulent, fleshy, drinking, breeding. He was actually very few of those things. He was not turbulent. He was quite calm. At a party, he'd, he'd be retiring over in the corner, kind of chatting to somebody. Wasn't much of a drinker. He was not a breeder, did not have any children. Uh, on and, you know, he, he invents this persona that's very much like a, uh, a, cosmo, uh, a cosmic version of the working class bohoy or rough of the streets that he tried, the, the democratic self that he tried to project himself uh, uh, as in his poetry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you wrote that book with the goal, as you, as you later said, uh, to find out what Whitman's own standpoint was. And do you think that you succeeded? And, and, and how do you know? I think the standpoint was really, really to try to bring together his nation that was on, on the verge of falling apart before the Civil War. And this is one reason why he creates this. He says, I am uh, of, of Vermont, of New Hampshire, of Maine, of Texas, of Alabama. He, he, he really tries to create a geography of inclusiveness mm -hmm. and a persona of inclusiveness. Now, now, when it falls apart during the Civil War, he becomes the great champion of, of both, not only of the North, but actually of the South and of Abraham Lincoln. Again, he's always trying to unify his nation and prevent it from collapsing and fragmenting. Mm, yeah. um, Megan, you write in the prologue to your biography of Margaret Fuller um, that uh, essentially the, the subject changed for you uh, during the course of your writing it. You, you said that you first wanted to write a book that would turn away from, quote, the intrigues of her private life and that spoke of public events only, unquote. Uh, but you eventually found that you really couldn't um, or didn't want to approach it that way. Um, why did you initially want to give us a purely political fuller, and what led you to, uh, to transform the, the project? Well, um, as I explained in the opening of the book, um, as I was starting my research, I went to the Houghton Library, which has most, of, uh, most all of Fuller's papers, and the first thing I asked to see was this astonishing journal she'd kept in Rome that survived the shipwreck in which she drowned. Um, and I wanted just to hold it in my hands. It had been its contents much of them had been uh, printed in a scholarly article. Um, but as, uh, so here's this kind of faded green thing, and it's a little bit water damaged, and it's from 1848, 49. And I, I open it, and in this is a little card um, written by in somebody else's hand that says, um, uh, private events merely, nothing, I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> nothing personal, public events merely. And I thought, you know, this, this brand that's been put upon her of the scandal of her love affair and her child born out of wedlock um, or conceived out of wedlock is preventing people from seeing really the accomplishment of Fuller, her great writings as a journalist, her, uh, her feminism. Um, everybody's always looking for the scandal. And I thought, you know, let's put that aside, kind of. Uh, it was a naive thought of mine. But I was kind of rising up against whoever it was had made, who had put this judgment on her her journal, which was, you know, who, uh, who, who would you, say? we would not say that about a man who kept a journal of the public events of the revolution and, and you know, people being assassinated and uh, all sorts of stuff. I mean, we want to know about that just as much, but because it was a woman, it seemed yeah. to me, people, and a woman with this particular personal history, people weren't, you know, as excited about this volume as I thought they should have been. But uh, um, as we were sort of saying here, too, generally about these figures of the American Renaissance, their personal lives their, and political lives, their public lives and personal lives could hardly be separated. And I think that was particularly true of Fuller. And I began to see that you know, it would be foolish to, to leave out the, this personal narrative. Too. Yeah, it, it is an interesting and I think very false dichotomy uh, that one does come across time and again, that biographies of men tend to be about action and biographies of women tend to be about emotion. Uh, and it's, I think, um, a failing of, of the genre up, up to this point, the one that we in, in our generation have inherited, and, and one that I, I think some of us are really trying very hard to correct, uh, as, as Fuller would have wanted us to, to do. Right? Mm -hmm. She says there is no purely masculine man, no purely feminine woman, and, uh, and you know, let's you know, you know, get, get more of a, a three-dimensional understanding. I'm, I'm interested that you, uh, that you mentioned the, um, the, the, the sensation, the feeling of holding Fuller's journal in your hands, because I, I would imagine that, that all of us 
really delight in those moments of some kind of personal contact with, with our subject. And it's something that I'd like to, to hear both from, from David and, and from Jeffrey about. David, uh, you've taught in Camden, which is sort of Walt Whitman Central in some ways. You live on Long Island, and, uh, and, and you're you know, teaching here in Manhattan. So, so you couldn't be spending much more time in, in Whitman land, uh, which is, which is yes, great. Uh, well, I've had the privilege of living in, in Whitman land I live not far from his birthplace, which is right across from the Walt Whitman Mall. <laughs> uh, I think, <laughs> and his death place down in Camden is quite uh, interesting as well. And more than that, when I wrote my book, I tried to hand, uh, get my hands on uh, each of the six major editions of Lee's Grass, so I could read them from cover to cover in their original form. And to me, that was so important, just to have them in my hand and, and just read them in their original form. It was just really, really important to me. Yeah. Quick question, uh, not on the subject of biography, but on the subject of, of Leaves of Grass. Um, Whitman scholars tend, tend to know this, that at the end of this poem that becomes Song of Myself in the 1855 edition, there's no period, right? right. It, it just, I stop somewhere waiting for you, and then there's no punctuation. Yes. And people go back and forth. Was that a printer's error, or was that Whitman just being well, open-ended? There are several uh, printings of that first edition, and, and to be sure, at least two of them do not have a period there. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I think there are, um, you know, I forget because there were a couple of paper versions and there was a, a hardbound edition, but I, I know that the, the period is absent uh, uh, there somewhere, I think in the hardbound edition, so I think, you know, yeah. and, and Whitman was very, very careful about punctuation. He had been a printer, so, and he violates grammar so intentionally throughout Lee's grass that it seems to me that that's probably intentional. Okay, yeah, yeah. all right, very good. Jeffrey, how about your thoughts about personal contact with, with Henry Thoreau? Certainly working half a mile from Walden Pond, I am immersed in Thoreau country, which I, I love. Um, but for me, holding or touching things that Thoreau had held or touched um, is, is somewhat inspiring. And, and, um, and so the first time I held what's known as the Maxim Daguerreotype, which is one of the, the only images of Thoreau, um, which he had taken for friends of his, so he had these daguerreotypes taken. Check your microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we're gonna start the program over again. <laughs> <laughs> Once more from the top, okay. <laughs> um, so the first time I got to hold the Maxim daguerreotype, which was an image that Thoreau had taken because friends wanted uh, a picture of him, um, it was truly awe-inspiring because it was an image that he had taken and was handed to him so that he could deliver it to his friends. So that's as close as I could ever get to yeah. Um, yeah. that connection. Yeah. Um, if, if there's still technical difficulties in, in hearing Jeffrey, I might suggest that you maybe switch lapels because you're naturally going to turn and, and talk to me and you'll be talking away from the microphone. Yeah. Sorry about this. Um, and, and of course, too, um, you know, being so connected with, with Thoreau, you get to luxuriate in all of the modern day Thoreau enthusiasts. And you know, <laughs> one, of, one of the great pleasures of, uh, of, of Concord, I think, is, is the annual Thoreau Society gathering in mm -hmm. July, because it brings in people really of all stripes. You've got the scholars. You've got the tree huggers. You've got the rebels who show up on their motorbikes. <laughs> you know. um, how, I, how, how do you respond to, to that, that sort of you know, interest? In, in it, it's, it's, it's difficult because everybody finds their own Thoreau. And, um, and so the reason people come to Thoreau is different for so many people that, as a literate person who's um, based in literature, I love the literary people who go to Thoreau for his writings. Um, the people who come on their motorcycles and come almost to be rebellious and say, I'm not going to be part of this organization that I'm part of. Yeah. Um, I don't have as much sympathy for those. <laughs> Fair enough. Have, have you gone on the, the, the sort of the, the dawn walk around uh, have, Walden? I've, I've done my group? own dawn walks, but not okay. with a group. Okay. Oh, I see. Very good. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting. You know, when one thinks of Thoreau, one thinks very clearly of a place, Walden Pond. When one thinks of Whitman, it's a little bit different because there are areas very concentrated to, to, consecrated to Whitman, but Whitman also is kind of sort of everywhere. Um, it's a more interesting question with Fuller, yeah. because Fuller is, in a sense, placeless uh, in that uh, her body was not recovered, so there's no grave to visit. There's, there's no particular house that she lived in that's, you know, but, okay. I have to stop here. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's well, there's wonderful, the birthplace. Yeah, but. there's a, um, the monument at Mount Auburn Cemetery. You're, you're right, it's, it's she, her it's body wasn't recovered, but yeah. that, the monument to Fuller and her husband, lover, and, and son, um, 
was through the 19th century the, the most visited spot in Mount Auburn Cemetery, and the first path that was um, made and then paved was led directly from the entrance of the cemetery to that, that, um, that lovely monument. Mm. Um, so I think people felt they could find her there if they'd find her anywhere. There's uh, also the birthplace, which is in a sort of humble part of Cambridge. I actually went there on last Tuesday, the date of publication of my book, just because I wanted to um, kind of observe that day. And this, this house is now the Margaret Fuller neighborhood house, a settlement house, yes. where they, there's a food pantry and an after-school program, and, and um, Margaret Fuller all over the place inside and posters and that sort of thing. So I think her spirit is there too. But maybe it's most powerful to me in Rome, where I've been lucky to go a few times to do some research and track down. It's known where she lived, and, mm -hmm. and in particular, um, actually, surprisingly, she's quite well known to Italians, better perhaps than to Americans. And there's a plaque on the house in which she lived on, in the uh, Piazza Barberini yeah. that honors her. So you, I think you can feel her there, too. Yeah. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is it still true that the only street in Rome named after an American is named after not FDR or JFK or anyone you might expect, but for Margaret Fuller. Well, there is there is a, a path. It's not yeah. quite a street. Okay. But, <laughs> but, but I don't know about the only you know yeah. uh, only American. That's uh, yeah. I, I read that. I've never I, verified it, so I'm, I'm really. You not, were finding uh, out things. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to to come back to something else, Megan, that you mentioned in your prologue. Um, you allude to Fuller's contemporary Hawthorne, who was sort of a, a friend of me of hers. Uh, and his observations about the literary genre of romance. Right? Um, Hawthorne writes that whereas a novelist is expected to show loyalty to actual experience, the author of a romance has license to, quote, bring out or mellow the lights and deepen and enrich the shadows of the picture, unquote. Now, you say that when you were writing your biography, you were keeping that idea of romance in mind and that you pursued, as Fuller would say, and as you said, some liberating measures. Um, just what did you mean by that, and, uh, and how did they affect um, the, the writing of the book? Well, I felt that in, in comparison with the Peabody sisters, where I was sort of um, plowing new fields yeah. <laughs> archivally, Fuller had been written about a great deal, and so the, the challenge to me was to tell the story in as vivid a way as possible, and that's why I began sort of to think of fiction and, and thought, of course, of, of Hawthorne's preface to The House of Seven Gables, and he write, which he, he makes yeah. this definition. So what I wanted to do really was to dwell, slow down the moments that, I, that were most compelling to me and perhaps do a little speeding up in between. Um, so I really spent a lot of time over the connection between Emerson, uh, Fuller and Walf Ralph Waldo Emerson, a lot of time on her years in Rome and, and the conflict she felt over leaving her child, uh, her, her infant behind in, in, with a wet nurse in Rieti, a town maybe 40 miles from Rome, when she felt also a, as compelling a need, more compelling a need to continue her work as a journalist covering this rise of the Republic and the fall of it. So uh, I just really wanted to examine the materials that were there and to dwell in that, in those moments of kind of crisis and build a story. I mean, we always are doing that when we're, um, when we're writing a biography, but I felt since there had been so much work done on her life before, this really freed me up. Yeah. Now, one of the complications of writing about Fuller is that one is having to work with, but also contend against the first biography of Fuller, which is Memoirs of Margaret Fuller um, Ossoli, that was uh, assembled by Emerson, James Freeman Clark, and, uh, and William Henry Channing. Um, one of the limitations, there are many limitations to that work, but one of them is that none of them knew her after about 1844, because then she was off to New York and she was off to Rome. And she transformed, I think, yeah. you know, intensely in, in, those, in those last six years. And so they were writing their memory in some sense of a transcendental Fuller, who was, by the time of, of her passing, much more politicized and inarguably transcendental no more. Well, Channing knew her very well in New York, so mm -hmm. I think that, okay, that, fair that enough. there's that. And, and there was the, the uh, correspondence between Emerson and Fuller while she was in Europe is really just uh, so moving. Mm -hmm. um, you're right, he's in a way trying to draw her back to that old Concord, but, but I think that um, they did their research and have been somewhat wrongly faulted for um, presenting a, a Margaret that, that's erroneous. I guess I, I began to feel a little bit, um, you know, they were such close friends, 
of her. They were doing a great work to keep her memory alive, and I think it was that book. I mean, that was the book that George Eliot read and became fascinated with Margaret Fuller. If, it, if that book weren't, weren't there, maybe we wouldn't be right. writing many biographies, biographies. So I actually right. did borrow a device from, that, their, uh, from their account, the uh, part headings. The, the section um, headings, yeah. The section headings, which were mostly geographical, um, kind of as an homage to their friendship. Mm -hmm. um, but it's true, they did kind of bastardize some of her letters, and, but, but we have those full letters now, mm -hmm. and um, we can recover her from their recovery. That's nice. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bug you just for one more question about, uh, about Fuller in particular, and then we'll, we'll yeah. um, uh, broaden uh, again. Um, just before Fuller voyages back to or toward America, uh, she settles for several months with her putative husband, uh, Giovanni Ossoli, and their son Nino in Florence. And it's a time during which she writes, quote, my heart was too suffocated without a child of my own, unquote, and quote, what a difference it makes to come home to a child, how it fills up the gaps of life, unquote. Now, as a male biographer writing about Fuller, I found the Florentine interlude to be kind of tricky um, because her own writings of the time seem to, at least superficially, um, support Sophia Hawthorne's judgment that all Fuller needed was a family and then she'd pipe down about women's rights and she wouldn't be so you know, up, upset with the world. And, and I'm curious whether you think it's politically easier for, uh, for a woman biographer to speak frankly about that period of domestic contentment. Uh, well, um, <laughs> I, I did say earlier that that was uh, her, her era of motherhood was one that particularly fascinated me. I think really spoke to me as, um, as a working parent, a working mother in particular. And, and um, there's a moment that I noticed, um, I found this very moving. She'd written, uh, this, this backing up a little from, from Florence when she's leaving the, her son in Rieti and going to Rome to, uh, he's four months old and she goes, spends a few months away writing about this, um, writing about the revolution that's coming and, and then she comes back to see him and um, she writes to Giovanni, her husband, lover, that um, he recognized her and how wonderful that was after the time away. But she writes somewhat later, finally um, confesses the existence of this lover and child to her friend Carrie Sturgis in a letter um, and to Carrie Sturgis, she admits that the child had sort of buried his face in her shoulder as if to say, how could you have left me? And I was so struck by the difference between what she had written to her husband and then what she could admit to this, this close friend who also had, had a child. And, and it was that moment that I you know, remember my, my own experience of leaving my young daughter and, and um, to do some research on the Peabody book, <laughs> and, and coming back and having her turn away from me momentarily, which you read in the child rearing books is something that they'll do, it's a healthy thing, but then they ultimately turn back. Oh. And um, so it, it is possible that those kinds of cues, you know, exactly, I, I was particularly fascinated by how she says that, you know, Nino is, um, I mean, the observations, he's, he's clearly bilingual, this is something I don't, I don't know that, I mean, I haven't hmm. read that part of your book, but maybe you did oh, comment no, 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 on no. it. That that you know he's in, uh, he's hearing the um, Austrian guards practice in the in the piazza outside their window, and and he'll say bravo, but he'll also say I, I can't remember what it was he said in English at the same time. So that was something I also picked up on. I I I, uh, I don't think that this was the the solution to her life, and she clearly knew it wasn't. And it, there's also this really astonishing moment that I found empowering in a way when um, she starts telling her friends back in the U.S. about her, her son and the marriage and Rebecca Spring writes back to her and, and says kind of what you said, Sophia Hoth, oh, isn't it wonderful to have a child so much better than a book? And she says, well, um, Fuller says, well, I, I don't necessarily think so. Of my book, I can know what result it would have. My son, I'll have to wait for 20 years. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I, I would be foolish having a John Brown expert and a Thoreau expert up here without uh, getting some interplay uh, between the two. Um, transcendentalism is, of course, Emerson in his study, and it's George Ripley at Brook Farm, but it's also Thoreau calling John Brown a transcendentalist above all. And I'm curious uh, to hear from, from both of you, why did Thoreau call Brown a transcendentalist, 
And was he right? Uh, yeah, I mean, Thoreau, uh, actually the reason I wrote about John Brown was originally because I used to teach a plea for Captain John Brown by uh, Henry David Thoreau. Mm -hmm. And he saw John Brown as a man of ideas. Why? Because when Brown, uh, Brown was in prison after he was captured at Harper's Ferry and he was held in jail, his prison letters were published to the world. And Thoreau really saw in these letters a selflessness, an expression of ideas. John Brown was very cheerful, awaiting his execution. He said, I want to die for enslaved people. I want to die for them. And I would be rather accompanied to my gallows by an enslaved black woman than I would by the greatest clergyman uh, in America. And this was the kind of thing that Henry David Thoreau, who had met uh, John Brown when he came to Concord in 1857, this was exactly the kind of thing that really uh, saw him as uh, standing for principle, mm -hmm. principle. So it wasn't so much uh, Brown's weapons. His weapons mm -hmm. were very weak, uh, said Thoreau. It was his words, really, that meant something. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey? Right. Um, for, for Thoreau, Brown was that transcendental hero, partly because he was disappointed in all the other heroes he had had already, his brother John, who had died young, Emerson himself. So um, he was looking for that, that kind of friend, that, that, that hero, which he found in Brown. I, I agree, it, is, it was the words and the power of Brown's words um, that really um, affected Thoreau um, mm -hmm. and allowed him to um, accept the fact that violence was a way towards an end, that there were other means besides just the pacifist means that we kind of associate with Thoreau, mm -hmm. um, that there's something greater. Yeah. I um, want to just say something yeah, back sure. to your question about, about why biography about these people. And, and um, I've been struck by civil disobedience, which you mentioned then, you know, maybe the greatest essay, the most influential essay in, in all ever written. Um, but if you look into the uh, story of how that actually got to the world, you find that, well, Thoreau gave a lecture about this. He was, you know, asked by his community in Concord to talk about why he, he, uh, he'd spent the night in jail. And then Elizabeth Peabody, my, my character, said, well, she'd like to publish this in a journal that had only one issue. Mm. Um, and there it was, resistance to civil government. Well, if she hadn't had that idea, you know, maybe someone would have published it, I guess. But, yeah. but it's also entirely possible that it never would have come down to us. And yet that essay goes on and has such repercussions. Yeah. To Gandhi, Martin Luther King, so many other people. It's just that uh, Thoreau once said, uh, with a single idea, you could float the British Empire like, empire like a chip. A single idea, and uh, the idea of civil disobedience is just, just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Jeffrey, your best known work thus far has been as an annotator of, of Thoreau's writings, and you're now branching into biography. But is, is it reasonable to posit that annotation is a form of biography? Certainly. I mean, uh, I could just put forth facts in my annotations. I tried to make them um, more of a narrative, more interesting um, about his life. Yeah. Um, but also, I, I talked to a lot of people, for instance, at the Thoreau Institute um, mm -hmm. about, about Thoreau. And, and they don't come for those, those little, he was born in this date. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly when it's high school students, the only way to keep them interested is to have a narrative, to have a story you're going to tell them, to have humor, to have um, suspense, um, to have tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm using those elements all the time yeah. when I'm talking to people. So it's, it's yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was fascinated in your annotation of the Maine woods. There's a, a, a Thoreau talks about a moose breaking through the plate glass window of a store, and <laughs> and you actually were able to find the the date, the name of the store, and and all of right. that. It was really amazing. <laughs> were were there other ahas that were particularly gratifying for you? These things that you tracked down and, and, and there discovered? are, um, for instance, in the book of his essays that's coming out um, in the next month. Um, I was talking to Megan before the the program that there are questions that people don't ever ask and. We're talking about 150 years since Thoreau spent his night in jail, and no one yet has asked um, who his cellmate was. Um, it's written about, he talks about his cellmate, um, but nobody actually asked. And I realized that if his cellmate was in jail, um, he went to court. There were court records, and nobody looked up the court records. So now we know um, who the cellmate was, um, and um, what he actually did, whose barn he burned down, and oh. did he go to jail? Yes, he did go to jail for five years in Boston. So we know a lot more about who the cellmate was. Um, oh. and, and those are kinds of the aha moments, those, those things that, why haven't people asked them before? Yeah, that's, that, that's really superb. Um, uh, now, you're currently branching out from annotation. You're writing a biography of the Emerson Thoreau friendship. Um, not necessarily two people who are the easiest persons to be friends with. <laughs> um, so how's, how's it coming along? It's coming along. I'm still in the initial stages. Um, 
I talk to a lot of people about, when, when people talk to me about Thoreau and Emerson, they always talk about the, the sort of breakup of their friendship. They were friends and then something happened. And nobody goes beyond that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really want to make these two men um, very human and very real. And there's a story that um, is told about Emerson. He's, he's very old and his mind is not what it used to be. It's long after Thoreau had died. And he has a visitor and he's looking at a portrait of Thoreau that was hanging in his study. And he calls to his wife in the other room, what was the name of my best friend? And that has always kind of tugged on my heart. Um, and I think if, if Emerson is looking um, in his old age as thorough as his best friend, there's a story there to be told. I, I thought Lydian would have said it's Amos Bronson all. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> um, what, in your opinion, is, is revealed by this approach of yours of looking at Emerson and Thoreau together that would be harder to see if we looked at them separately? Well, I think friendship was a an ideal for a lot of the transcendentalists. They all wrote about it, it was very important to them. So they were looking for something very specific. Um, and I think both Thoreau looking for it in Emerson, and Emerson actually looking for it in Thoreau, um, was very unique. Um, and in many ways, they inspired each other, they um, worked off of each other, and, um, and so I think that we're gonna find a better understanding of each of these two men by looking at how they looked at each other. Mm. Um, just a couple more questions, and we'll, we'll then throw it out for, um, uh, for, for um, questions from the audience. Um, I think that one of the great challenges for scholars, and, and something that, um, that you know, the, the, the work that all of you have done uh, does quite convincingly, is, is, is to show how the literary culture of a period interacts with the broader culture of the time. Um, we know that Emerson and Melville and Whitman influence us, but how do we know the ways in which they influence people at the time? You're particularly someone like Melville, who was you know, almost effaced during his lifetime. How, how can we recapture that, that sense of influence? Well, with Melville, it's very tough because he was a bestseller early on. Then Moby Dick fell like a lead balloon, and Pierre, uh, there were, you know, Herman Melville's crazy was one of the headlines, and so, and he kind of tails off on the confidence man. I think he does have a certain kind of cultural influence because his name is, is serving the culture. But someone like Emerson and, and Thoreau have a, a surprisingly large influence. Emerson was a very important cultural figure. And when he spoke, uh, people would listen, even though he was not a joiner. Neither of them liked to join movements, the abolitionist movement or the women's rights movement or whatever. But when they spoke, uh, people would listen. So when Emerson says, John Brown will make the gallows as glorious as the cross, that ricocheted like a bullet in both North and South, and really, really was repeated everywhere. They said, oh, my God, Ralph Waldo Emerson actually said this. So it, it's amazing. And it really became a very, very controversial kind of statement. And even Thoreau's uh, John Brown essay was published in the New York Tribune, and he gave it in several venues. And what, you know, what, what's your feeling about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean it, Thoreau was getting up in the church in Concord basically right. saying that John Brown is equivalent to Jesus Christ. The, right. only, the only living American um, hadn't yet been hanged. And that gets um, no, noticed. Yes, it did. And there were people in Concord who went to hear Thoreau speak who really went to mock him, who went to make fun of him, um, and left um, in support and praising John Brown. He was a very powerful speaker, right. and yeah. he could turn things around. Well, and I think also Fuller's uh, dispatches from Rome that were describing these um, Right. The, the flower of Italian youth who were giving their lives and limbs to this cause of liberty and unification in Italy were, were powerfully influential in, in, on Whitman and... Absolutely. Ab absolutely, yeah. 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 Uh, another interesting thing that we have to contend with is um, the, the idea of the representative person. Uh, in that, um, you know, a, a beginning student, at least, coming to this period who reads about Thoreau or Whitman or Fuller, is likely to assume that they are typical of their era, whereas, in fact, you know, their great contribution was being atypical. Um, that's one of the misconceptions that, that a person can have about um, the American Renaissance, this, this notion of, of the representative versus the exceptional. But my, my broader question is, uh, for, for all of you, um, in, in what ways do we reflexively tend to misread this period? And, and what can we do, what, what can we do as, as, as authors to fix that, but what can we also do as readers to, to correct for whatever I think we biases? tend to see them as too much alienated from their culture. They're very much human beings 
living in their time, in their culture, and yes, we can enjoy their works, and, and, and their works uh, come alive for us today, right now, but they're also very, very much part of their environment, and too often they're isolated from their environment. Not in present company, but uh, <laughs> uh, just in general, I think so. Using common language, I mean, Thoreau read all the newspapers, he knew exactly what was going on in his time, so he, he could speak to people in a way that they would understand, the way that they could appreciate. I also think it's a mistake to consider Fuller um, a lesser writer than the others. Yeah. Um, she wrote in different genres. It's hard to put her into the you know, American literature curriculum, but she was a journalist, she was um, a psychologist, mm -hmm. and uh, she was a travel writer. So her a poet, a short story writer. Yes, yeah. all these things. Um, so I think that's one way she sort of didn't quite make it into the canon, for, uh, along with other reasons we could think of. Right. Um, <laughs> but I think she was a profoundly insightful writer and a forethinker, um, and that that's a, that's a mistake that is often made that she sort of apologized for. She's a, you know, again the great dramatic life story, but maybe not so great as a thinker and writer. But I would dispute that. Okay. In, in closing, it, it bears mention that um, Emerson, Thoreau, and Fuller were all profoundly distrustful of biography. Uh, Emerson condemned the writing of biography as the building of sepulchers to the past. Uh, Fuller wrote, all biographies make me sick at heart and make it hard to realize that there is a heaven. And Thoreau, and Thoreau wrote, you may rely on it that you have the best of me in my books and that I am not worth seeing personally, the stuttering, blundering clodhopper that I am. Um, I think that perhaps after this past hour, all three of them would feel a little bit better about the, uh, the practice of biography. And, uh, and uh, you're, you're welcome to ask questions, but first, let's have a round of applause. I think this is great. So please, from the audience. And we have microphones up as well. Uh, yes, Ms. Eisler. Use the microphone. Thanks. Sorry, I was sure. Thank you. What a moment to have a pause. The subject of scandal. Scandal, <laughs> yes. With with suspense, yeah. naturally. Yeah. But I was very interested in your remarks about scandal, uh, uh, particularly dogging the question of women's biography. Um, and perhaps to just modify that somewhat, I think it would largely depend on the way it is perceived by the subject to a large extent. Uh, as a biographer of George Sun, I think of no more contrasting figure in the just the, to isolate the role of scandal mm -hmm. than in Margaret Fuller, for example, because it seems from what we know of reading both of your marvelous books uh, is that it was somewhat anomalous uh, in that she presented or at least of those who knew her work and something about her life uh, of a somewhat austere, uh, cerebral uh, woman, uh, the, the woman intellectual, the uh, uh, taking on really a man's role uh, in that realm, and to have the, the scandal of personal and sexual life uh, uh, emerge uh, was something that seemed anomalous again, whereas Sand ever looking at the market uh, mm -hmm. essentially used the scandal in her life as her as subject matter. Um, so I'm wondering if there isn't a, a large degree, a spectrum of diversity uh, that um, the scandal, the scandal spectrum, the scandal <laughs> spectrum <laughs> to use it or to uh, yeah. Well, I think you're right that Fuller did think for much of her life that she could comment on gender issues, as we'd call them today, um, much more effectively if she stood apart from them, or that's what she told herself. Uh, but she, there was also this strong element in, in her that, that demanded that she experience all, and in the end she did. You know, that was her, her choice, but I think she certainly came from such a different background that it was hard for her, although she uh, was uh, dismissed those who would dismiss her, and there are some very moving passages in which she says, well, if they, if they don't care for me, then I don't care for them. 
she could rise above it, but whether she, but exploiting it was not something she was gon going to do. This also would be much more dangerous uh, yes, in this Yes, I think with her, her particular I readership. Might have resulted in her never getting published. And you know there were plenty of people who thought she was better off dead than, than surviving this wreck and having to face the scandal. Um, and it's very, you know, I, I, I read that partly as a way of these friends consoling themselves for her loss. You have to find a reason to that this happened, but it was a different world that she was returning to. Thank you. Um, yes, Ms. Riley. Uh, Cece Riley, um, John Jay College. I have a question regarding, I guess, uh, the ethics of annotators and uh, biographers. And it has to do with uh, somehow putting together s either staying in the time period of the person you are writing about versus looking at the, not just that, but the impact uh, for current times and possible, possibly for the future. Uh, it was a really egregious example uh, of this in a, an annotated uh, version of Dante's Inferno that I had occasion to look at last year, where one of the annotations was that uh, Dante knew there was going to be ice in hell because Pluto, the planet Pluto, has ice on it. Now, obviously, Dante or anybody at that time, <laughs> while they may have been delving into science, had no way to know that uh, to be the case, uh, let alone Dante, who wasn't doing scientific experiments, uh, you know, would, would get to know that. So how do you, what can we expect in terms of the ethics of, of this type of thing as a reader of uh, biography and uh, autobiography and memoirs and how we can stay, those of us who write it can, uh, make sure that we are ethically correct. May I, or? Speaking as an annotator, um, when I've annotated several of Thoreau's books, I use no source that Thoreau could not have used. So there is no definition, um, whether it's a dictionary or an encyclopedia, there's nothing in my books um, that Thoreau could not have read himself. So um, I always had to trace things prior to when he actually put the last word in his manuscript for a particular book or work. Um, yeah, I always uh, go back to the original sources, and uh, biography is a good cure. Writing a biography is a good cure for presentism and, and anachronism, or it should be, uh, because you, you really should try to go back and just concentrate on the world in which that person lived and the documents in that world, the newspapers and the sermons and this and that and the other, and the, the writings that surrounded them, it seems to me. Uh, uh, rather than trying to impose today's views on the past. One technique that I've come to after um, all this time, or maybe mostly through the Peabody Sisters, is there's, I think you're talking about, you know, how can we be fair to them, but also how can we draw our reader back into that time. Um, and I've found it useful not to quote at great length from the subjects I'm writing about. Um, I try to avoid block quotations uh, because I think the reader loses track of the narrative thread, but I do quote a great deal nonetheless, you know, phrases and um, there, there are a few paragraphs in my book that don't have the language of the subjects in it. So I try to, you know, similarly, I don't, tr I try not to use anachronistic language or, or concepts, but I, um, but I, I try to keep it there, and as a result, I hope that the reader feels they're kind of experiencing life as my subjects did. Uh, one can learn all too quickly as a biographer the truth of the saying that assume makes an ass of you and me. 
Uh, there's, uh, and I just have to give a, an, ex an example from, from, my, from my own work that, that some of you have uh, I, I've told about already. But uh, when I was writing Eaton's Outcasts, I wanted very much to evoke the atmosphere of Concord, Massachusetts. And it's wonderful that so much of the old Concord has been preserved so that it's remotely possible to do this. You know, if, you're, if you're writing about uh, you know, Theodore Roosevelt's childhood or something, it's very hard to go to, to, to walk around Manhattan and, and try to you know, recreate uh, what, what was there. Um, but anyway, so I was walking along uh, a, a road in Concord in, in, the, in the springtime, and I saw cardinals, you know, beautiful red birds flying in the trees. I thought, ah, great detail for the, uh, for the book. I'll talk about the cardinals of Concord. Uh, and so I, I mentioned them in one of my chapters, and uh, the month after the book came out, got a hot email from, uh, from an ornithologist who said, don't you realize that cardinals did not come to Concord until the 20th century? How dare you? That sort of thing. Uh, and, and so uh, you know, the, only, the only thing you can do in, in that circumstance is to, uh, is to write back and say thank you, and uh, we'll fix it in the paperback. And uh, you know, we, we, we try to get things right. Uh, as, as we know, it I doesn't had a, always happen. A near miss with um, the, the dome of the State House in Boston, which I had you know, known all, most of my life. And it, in the very beginning of that book, The Peabody Sisters, I talked about the gold dome of the State House, and it just happened that there was a little article in the Globe about um, the transforming design of the State House, and sure enough, it wasn't gold in the 1840s, it was copper, so I could fix that. But uh, something that I am worrying I may have to change, I don't know, was the very first line of the Peabody sisters that, you know, that summers back then were as hot as they are today. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, because right. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, it was, did get up into the high 90s, but, um, yeah. you know, it's Yeah, there, there, there can be facts, quote unquote, that are so familiar to you that you just know that they're right, so you don't bother to check them, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, disaster, <laughs> you know, mild disaster can, can ensue. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, I but think then people can sometimes accuse you of getting things wrong, even though you actually are right, because it's uh -huh. counterintuitive to them. Right. Okay. Anything else? I have a okay. Yes, uh, Professor Suggs. Oh, thank you. Um, this is a question about the relationship, I think, of biography to literary history. Um, I noticed that there are almost no, or actually there are no biographies of African American writers of the antebellum period. Uh, and very few of any African-American writers of the 19th century, generally. Um, aside from this sort of funny question of who were the African-American transcendentalists, the only way I can think of, of addressing this is to note that the benchmarks of American literature in the 19th century are not necessarily the same benchmarks as those for African-American literature in the 19th century. And I wonder if our, the way in which our scholarship is embedded in rather traditional benchmarks keeps us from looking at antebellum African-American writers uh, in their own in, uh, particular political and uh, social context because they don't pop up in the, uh, at the markers of which we're accustomed to looking. Good point. Uh, I mean, there are books on Frederick Douglass and so forth, and, and uh, there's a lot of writing on African American writers, but you're right. In terms of biography, they're certainly underrepresented, and that should be rectified. Absolutely, it should be rectified. Uh, it seems to me, I think that too often we allow the, the uh, slave narratives, so to speak, as they were called, speak for themselves, and we don't enough reconstruct the actual lives of some of these enslaved persons. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to make that the last word. Uh, we just don't have any more time. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, we will be back in about uh, 10 minutes with uh, Writing Jewish Lives. Thank you.